In our last episode, Grammy Award winner Marcus Humman discussed his successful career as a songwriter. Today, in the second half of our interview, Marcus discusses his passion for writing musical theater and gives us a rare look into the world of a playwright. <laughs> so you've had, obviously, an incredible success with your songwriting, and you've been getting into a lot of other things, such as playwriting and composing for musicals. Can you tell us a little about that experience? Well, yeah. Um, it's... Um... It's kind of a whole other world. It's it's sort of based on the same. The, the building blocks are still is still songs in, in a lot of ways, and also um, to a certain extent, a song is is kind of like a play. It has a first and a second act, and and sort of a, a breaking moment. And there are a lot of things that are similar about it, but a lot not a lot of writers songwriters go into theater, and it may be because it's a very difficult business, and it's a um, it's really joyful but it's also filled with a lot of criticism and takes a lot of time a lot of time out of your your life i mean if you're going to really endeavor to write a musical you need to understand that you're going to be you may spend you may spend a year writing it and you may spend the rest of your life editing it you know um, a lot of shows that go on and become plays that we know something about often have many premieres because people will come in and they will re rewrite it for example um, after three or four productions of The Piper, I just decided that the book, the play part of it, we call the book, I wanted it to be better and I had just, I, I felt like even, I just felt like I had been looking at it for so many years that I almost couldn't see it anymore. So a buddy of mine, Michael Amen, who's a playwright and, and teaches uh, screenwriting in New York, I said, can you, can you just come in and just take the play as it is and breathe some new life? I don't want a new story. I don't even want, I want the basic scene, the, you know, I don't want everything gone, but I, I just need someone to come in and look at it. So, you know, seven, eight years down the road, here's another guy coming in and another production, and we've already done a, we've already done a rewrite, and we're already pitching it to new theaters. So I, I just think that you have to be prepared to really spend a lot of time, and that means you better, to me, what it means is you better love the subject. When writing your musicals, where do you get most of your inspiration? What I wanted to do once I got off the road is I want to have that place to dream. Because when you're an artist, you dream. You dream, you put yourself in different situations. Uh, albums become canvases. They're not simple. They're, they're, hopefully they're very beautiful. Um, and I wanted that again. And I also wanted to talk about things which, I wanted to talk about sort of anything I felt passionate about. So that is the main focus of theater for me. I only pick subjects which for some reason or another I'm, I have a, a strange obsession with. One of your musicals, The Piper, just premiered at Belmont University's Black Box Theater. Can you tell us a little about that? It's a play that is sort of fanciful. It's um, the version that they did at Belmont, uh, Bill and Valley, the directors actually did it as a dream as a dream sequence, and, and it has never been produced as a dream. But in the story, the child um, actually has, um, I guess you would, you would say, supernatural ability as a musician. And, um, and so there, there's always been a sense of that show as a kind of fable. And, uh, and I think people enjoy that. And at the Belmont performance, you performed a song. Yeah. Uh, I uh, um, allowed myself to be hung. And there's a scene where these three men are uh, accused of horse thieving, and they're about to be hung by the kind of the bad guys, the villains in the story. And this is the late 1800s Boston, you know. So these are poor, these men are poor. And so they sing a song really about their poverty, and they go like, uh, uh, the first voice goes, you know, I was once a sailor, threw my lot upon the sea, left my only sister Clara on the docks of Liverpool. third voice is, is low, he's a bass, he goes, what's a man but a poor soul? I can't even sing it. 
dead weight on a woven rope. And eventually they all sing this as it's a trio and they're singing those same parts and then they come out blocked out in harmony. From It's a moment in the play that doesn't, it's not dramaturgically central, it's just a color piece that I feel is important and what it has to say about the nature of, of humanity and about suffering. And I thought, this is a great chance where I don't have to act. I get to walk in, sing the song, be one of the guys, and get hung. It's great. Are you also involved in other aspects of your musical, such as set design, wardrobe design, lighting, or anything of those sorts? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, I, I have to admit I'm kind of an um, obsessive sketcher, so um, I do uh, tend to sketch conceptually uh, what I think is happening in a scene. I mean, one of the things I, uh, I feel about the playwriting side of my life is that you should, whether or not you're going to end up being the director or not, which in most cases you're not, you should basically write as if you were a director. Um, it's important for me when I write a scene that I'm in, I can see the scene. And the way I, uh, I work on that is I, I do, uh, I'll do sketchbooks and, and I'll, I'll move characters around. And you know, the thing about that too is that you, uh, you don't want to get too tied to it because the next thing you know you're doing a play, you have a director, the director has to have the right to uh, envision a scene any way they want. How has education and training played into your career? Mm. Uh, well, uh, it, it's, it's kind of funny because I don't come from, I don't have a, a classical background. Um, I took, um, you know, guitar and piano a little bit when I was a kid. And, and, uh, but what I do think is very important, I'm a big proponent of a liberal arts education. I think it's very important in whatever you do. And certainly as a writer, as a songwriter and a playwright, whatever it is you're trying to do, if you're going to, if you're going to write, um, you know, having a broad, a broad-based education, I think, is very, very important. I know as a parent, you know, that I encourage my eldest, our eldest son is, is a freshman in college at a liberal arts college, and, and I've told him, you know, I consider the opportunity, the, the fact that we can help you pay for college, that we can give you this, this is a gift, and, you know, and you should understand it as such, because that's what my parents gave to me. They gave me a chance to go and just study broadly. I could read about philosophy or do mathematics or... And all of those things, believe it or not, I really, I really think all of those things ultimately come into play into who you are as a writer and as an artist. So do you have any advice to give to an aspiring songwriter or playwright? Well, uh, it's a tough life. I remember when, uh, <clears throat> when I left college, uh, I then planned to, to go to L.A. initially to start my career. And I thought well, when I set out that I was just going to be a star right away. You know, and I remember my mom crying when I left home, and she said, you know, you've picked a really tough life. And I literally, I, I felt like, you know, poor woman, she doesn't realize, you know, this is going to be a breeze for me. And of course, she was exactly right. You know, it, was, it took another 10 years of my life before I actually got a record deal. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a privilege to do this kind of work. And I think it's almost the kind of work that you should almost take like a vow of poverty. And you should go into it as if you're like some novitiate or something. And that it's a way of life. It's this whole pilgrimage. It's a way to look at the world. And, you know, any way that you can continue to do it, any way, whether it means to be a, you know, have a waiting job on the side and then do this passionate thing that you love, or if you're fortunate enough to have a little publishing deal, you go with that. I, I think it's that kind of, it's more that kind of an enterprise. It's very passionate and it's, it's, a, it's truly a way of life. So, you know, that's, it's kind of, that's kind of the good news and the bad news. You know, it's, it may well be very, very tough. You may well have picked a hard career. Marcus, I learned so much from you today. Thank you so much. That advice was incredible. It's something I can take along with me, so thank you. Well, thank you. Thanks for taking the time to interview me and ask me questions, and good luck with your singer-songwriter thank career. Thank you. Thank you yeah. again for your time. You want to play us out with something today? Sure. I will. Uh, let me do, you know, I'll play a melody from, I did uh, an opera with the Nashville Opera Company, and I'm going to do 
something from uh, Surrender Road. Oh, what a piece of work is man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculties and form and movement admirable and in action how like an angel in apprehension how like a god thanks marcus you can learn more about Marcus Hummin by visiting our website at volstate.edu forward slash presents. You can view more segments from our show by visiting our website at volstate.edu forward slash presents.